Perfect. Hmm. Hello, Jack. V Gates. Good, hopefully. <laughs> Good. Good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we got a little bit of German. Auch gut, vielen Dank, yeah. Yeah, huh. okay. So, um, I guess with our small but mighty breakout room tonight, I did make a couple of slides again. So I will go ahead and share those. Okay, this is a sneak preview, excuse me. Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Yes? Thumbs up? Thumbs up, okay. Uh, Jack and Elena, are you able to unmute this evening? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and it, I mean, it's such a small group. If you want to stay unmuted, you're more than welcome to throughout this meeting. I think this will pretty be a pretty open format. You can chime in whenever you feel like you want to. So welcome to the December 6th, the Virtual Science Club Math and Engineering Breakout Room. So per usual, I was hoping to do a little bit of an icebreaker. So if you could please tell us, Elena, I don't know if we've crossed paths before. So if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself in addition to these prompts, that would be great. But otherwise, if you could tell us your favorite Thanksgiving food, if you like giving presentations or public speaking and any ideas you might have or your status on the Southern, Appa Southern Appalachian Science and Engineering Fair project topic. So I guess I'll go first. This is controversial, but my favorite is actually cranberry sauce. My mom made a really delicious one this year. Um, I'm not a huge fan of public speaking, but I am working on it. So this is something that we, and we will be talking about public speaking tonight, so we can all kind of work on that together. And then in terms of the SACEF project, if anybody needs help, I'm committed to helping you. So with that, um, I guess I'll just go down the, the line of my Zoom participants. Nicholas, if you want to go first, you can kick it off. I, I also like cranberry sauce, but I'm going to trade it up, change it up a little bit. Pumpkin pie. Understandable. It's delicious. It, it's breakfast the next day. It's practically a breakfast food, right? It's just a pastry with wonderful that <laughs> all the oil yeah you can't really yeah you really yeah, yeah. It sounds, it's delicious yes uh, in terms of presentations at some point i guess i started liking doing it i didn't before for a long time i wasn't a big fan of it it eventually got used to it and kind of enjoy it now yeah are you like i don't know are you still very active on the conference scene or do you are you do you teach classes or do you like where is the place that you so I do a lot of conferences and workshops mostly workshops mm -hmm. um and short seminars I love it when I get to teach like a guest lecture because then it's like a full like hour to two hours which is great yeah um and uh every once in a while I get to give like an actual like multi-session class, but that doesn't happen as often as it used to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, nowadays though, I'm stuck. This will happen eventually in your career. Someone will poke you and say, hey, why don't you help organize the symposia? Yeah. Resist. <laughs> Noted, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's great fun because you get to see everybody's work a little bit ahead of time, which is kind of fun, but yeah, <laughs> you go and you lose all your hair trying to get everybody to show up to the hybrid meetings. <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. 
Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, okay, so I guess Jack is unable to unmute this evening, but I'll just read his answers. So he likes rolls for number one. Keeping it useful since I don't know Thanksgiving foods very well other than turkey, lol. Yeah, that's the class. It's a classic. Yeah, fair. And then... And he said no to public speaking, but that's not why he's unmuted. <laughs> Fair. No, that's okay. No worries. You're good, Jack. Why he's muted. Yeah. And then do you have you thought about the the science here anymore? Or just kind of here for science club. Just fun to come here. Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. I think it's fun, too. Okay, so then I guess, Elena, if you want to unmute and say your answers verbally, otherwise, whatever format you're most comfortable with. Uh, I like stuffing um, during Thanksgiving. That's a good one. And I guess public speaking is, like, okay, but it's, like, not my most favorite thing to do. Mm hmm Yeah. That's fair, kind of. It can go either way. Yeah, and then, like, um, for the fair, I'm thinking, like, of doing, like, um, an AI art project, but, like, I'm not 100% sure yet. Oh, wow. And an AIR. Is that what you said? Yeah, something like that. Okay, you'll have to explain what that is to me because I don't know. What what does AIR mean or stand for? Uh, like it's like, um, using like I guess algorithms to like generate images, kind of. So like an artificial intelligence type. Yeah. Okay, so AI is the artificial intelligence part. Okay. Wow. Well, that's very cool. How are have you started doing that, or are you kind of still developing an idea, or where? where yeah, I've kind of started doing that for like um something else but like yeah yeah well I mean this presentation tonight is geared towards public speaking but I mean if you want to talk more about that I think um that definitely takes priority or if you need any help you can definitely um yeah reach out like we're happy we're like I said we're happy and committed to help you out with whatever so Okay, uh, with that being said, I guess I'll just keep going. So um, I, I guess just to break things up between our uh, icebreaker and our the meat and potatoes of our presentation, just a little fun fact. So have either of you, I guess Jack or Elena, heard of hydroelectric power? And if so, what do you know about it? Yes, it powers my house. That's awesome. How do you know specifically that it powers your house? Or do you think it's just part of the TVA utility? My area is powered by the dam. That's awesome. Okay, so we have... And so far, has it been reliable for the most part? I guess probably more problems with your transmission lines than anything, but. Okay, so I guess to give a little um, more info on it, let's see yes other than tva not telling construction workers where not to dig yeah that's not not ideal when you're talking about power lines um but so basically how hydroelectric power generation works so it's the generation of the power that's used to you know turn lights on power electric uh systems in your house is um, a hydraulic turbine uh, converts energy of flowing water into mechanical energy. And 
what you can see on this graphic in the upper left is that a dam is put in place so that you have varying water levels and then actually the water in this schematic the the method of hydroelectric power generation is through gravity so that fall, falling water basically creates a flow which turns a turbine and then a little above it you can see that hydroelectric generator converts mechanical energy into electricity and going in a little bit more on that hydroelectric generator in the turbine configuration it's all based on uh what's what was discovered by faraday who is a scientist the fair uh, the Faraday effect, I believe. And when a, so when a magnet moves past a conductor, electricity flows. So that's the kind of leading concept of that. And in the case of large generators, like the one on the bottom right, electric electromagnets made by circulating direct current through loops of wire around the stacks of magnetic steel. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, lamination. So actually, so the current or the the magnets on the rotor spin, which then creates current flow through the stator, stator part. And then that eventually is transmitted and carried off to the grid. So let's see. Okay. And also another component of, or potentially interesting component of hydroelectric energy is that in some cases it can follow uh, grid demand so like for example at night when people are sleeping uh the energy need goes down i mean you're not you don't have your lights on you're not actively using devices you're um you know maybe you turn the temperature of your house down a little bit if you have electric heating um so basically then that excess electricity can be stored and used to pump if it's a stagnant water source, it can be used to pump water back up to whatever is holding the water back. And then in the daytime at peak operating hours, that water can then flow back down and, and spin the turbine and then and, and generate electricity. And actually, something that I've learned since my background is a little bit in nuclear energy, a lot of what energy sources are is just turning this turbine, then using Faraday's effect to then generate um, power using these big these big generators. So really these concepts, sorry, there's a train in my neighborhood. I don't know if you can hear that, but um, <laughs> really these concepts are pretty, pretty uh, consistent across the board for a lot of different energy generation methods is, is basically your working fluid is spinning a turbine, which then converts is converted into electricity. So kind of interesting. And then going a little bit further into this hydroelectric uh, effect or power generation method, does anybody have any idea what the largest by power generation or megawatts, which is a oh, <laughs> which is a generation metric would be? Which I did certainly did not know this, but it actually is in China. It's the three. Gorges Dam, it produces 22 over 22,000 megawatts, which is just an insane amount of power. Um, it was built from 1994 to 2012 with out of over 400,000 tons of steel, which would be enough to build 63 Eiffel Towers, which is just crazy. It's over a mile long, and it's actually one of the only man-made structures that's visible from space, according to NASA. So it's just an incredible, incredible engineering uh, feat to have this work. It provides power for over 22 million people, which is also insane, but that's still only 1.7% of China's population, according to 2012 statistics. And it also, another effect of hydroelectric power is this, in, the, in particular, this river, I believe it's called the Yangtze River, used to flood. Uh, and there would be floods that would displace or, you know, even kill millions of people. And because of this dam that's provided control of the river more and flow of the river more, so this flooding hasn't been as much of an issue. It did displace over 400,000 people, though, to be able to build it and actually dam the river up. So it's kind of a 
kind of a pros and cons to these kind of projects, which is important for engineering. So, uh, and then just one more fun fact, and then I swear I'll stop talking about hydroelectric power, at least for now. Um, so the largest in the US is the Grand Coulee Dam, which was built almost or started construction almost 100 years ago, and it's on the Columbia River in Washington. You can see it down here. So. There used to have a really cool laser light show on the Grand Coulee Dam. Really? Yeah. Wow. Have you, yeah. so I assume you've seen. Yeah, I, I've been there a couple, uh, once and I've driven by it another time, but I actually just watched the laser light show once. Wow. And how do they, how does that work even? Like how do they. They project it on the dam mm -hmm. on the other side of, so that you have the reservoir on one side and then you have the dam and it's, there's actually a big kind of blank space to it and they do a laser light show on it that's awesome it, it, it's yeah. it's a cool watch i don't know if they still do that but it was a really cool watch i did I saw it when i was i think 10 10 or 11 oh, years wow. old yeah oh my gosh wow yeah i'll have to i didn't find that in my research but maybe that's yeah. a local hack i don't know if you're from that area i, I mean i i grew up in washington so i don't I had a chance to go over there in that side of Washington several times, and we stopped by the Grand Coulee one time, and they were like, oh, stick around for the laser light show. Oh, I did wow. not know that was a thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Local hack. So if anybody gets to the Columbia River and the Grand Coulee Dam, watch out for the laser light show. I think that's our takeaway from it. If it's it. still there, let me know, because that, that would be fun. Yeah. Awesome. And I think maybe did we lose Elena, but I think we lost Elena. Madhouse? I don't know. Is that is that your name? Yep. Uh, I just joined a few minutes ago. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. We're happy to have you. We're just I we're just going through a few fun facts for the week, but later we're going to be talking about um a little bit of presenting or effectively communicating your results. So. Um, I guess I'll ask real quick, have you thought about a SACEF topic or a science fair topic? Like a SACEF? Is that what you just said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have. You have it. I don't you... think I know what SACEF is in the first place. Okay. Oh, so yeah. it is the South Appalachian. Okay. I have a slide on this. So I'm going to. I'm going to switch slides. Okay. So it's a Southern Appalachian Science and Engineering Fair. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a, a science fair that you can register for, and it's mm -hmm. a bunch of different counties can participate. So if you're interested, um, I think the registration website is on the bottom right, but that'll give you a lot more information. And maybe, I don't know, Nicholas, if you wanna, yeah. if you have more info about that too. Yeah, so the, uh... The registration page is down there. You have to get a teacher to register and then you can re for your school and then you can register in. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not too terribly difficult typically, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, and the great thing with it is we have a lot of awards that people can, can win. So there's beyond just the, the awards that SACEF themselves give out for students for their and prizes. There's also several special prizes tied to um, national sponsors. Uh, so there's opportunities to get uh, lots of recognition for your work. And you get a other nice thing is a lot of the judges are professional scientists or um, engineers from uh, the Knoxville or around the Knoxville area. So you get a chance to share your work with um, with the uh, local scientists and engineers and that, that's always kind of fun because you get a lot of feedback and having been a judge in the past i can say that that's actually a lot of fun to see uh what everyone what everyone comes up with and, and you get some good conversation out of it so mm -hmm. hopefully uh if you're interested you'll take a look at the registration site and uh, get some more info out of it but uh it, it's a great great fair and 
And we'd love to have you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, it's, it's oh. also ISIF affiliated. I forgot to mention that. It's ISIF affiliated. So for high school, see the senior level, so the high school students, um, the winner of the of the fair can go to uh, ISIF, which is the International Science and Engineering Fair, which I um, think this year is in I'm, Texas. I'm a freshman currently, so I'm not sure if I can do that yet. Yeah, I, I don't mean, think you should be in the. I don't think you should be in the um, senior level. You are. I, I double check the the fair web page, but I'm pretty sure that that puts you in the senior level. It's we normally split it by middle schoolers and then high schoolers. Okay, so by I, senior, so by senior level, you don't mean like the grade level senior. You mean like high school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like, there's a junior level, which is the middle, which is sixth to eight, sixth grade to eighth grade, and then there's a senior level, which is ninth grade through twelfth grade. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I see in the chat is fair is the Faraday cage named after this Faraday? Yes, I think that's the same person. Mm. Yeah, one of the greats of. Uh, electricity and magnetism. Okay. But he had little former or formal training, so that's an inspiration to, to all of us. Excellent experimentalist. Excellent experimentalist. Really struggled with math for a, like his whole career. Mm -mm. But he was really, really good at doing setting up and designing experiments. Wow. Yeah. It's a good skill to have. Okay, I guess one more thing. So if you have a, a dangerous or relatively dangerous or ha hazardous experiment, your registration deadline is the, or you need pre-approval by the 18th and then project registration is the February 28th. So, okay. Moving on. So, uh, Jack, I think you were here for maybe our first couple of meetings. Matt, have I think you might be new, um, but I guess we've kind of, or throughout the weeks, we've kind of been going through how to design a science fair project, kind of from a broad sense. And um, we talked about the scientific method last week. We covered using reliable resources. So. I guess just to do a little rehash of what we talked about last week. So finding a science fair topic isn't always the most straightforward, but I think Google's your best friend when it comes to, to finding a topic. So, um, and specifically looking at finding reliable resources, finding a, a broad cursory search, like for example, via Google, um, just make sure you find a scientifically credible source that supports your references um, and actually cite your scientifically credible, credible sources. Um, and then just a few tips, identify criteria for evaluating research resources. Um, it should be, you know, if you're using online websites, it should be, you know, a government website or something reliable. I know we had a debate about Wikipedia last time um, but as we learned, the bottom of the Wikipedia page often has some more scientifically credible resources that are cited. So um, maybe look through those. Uh, ident identify strategies for locating relevant print and electronic resources. And I think um, I shared an anecdote. So using my local or school library and librarians was instrumental for me in some of my earlier uh, projects. They really helped me locate either books or they printed even journal articles for me to read. It was super helpful. So I really recommend that. And then, um, yeah, just some other tips and understand why many electronic resources may not be the most credible. Yeah, and Jack, you're totally right. So I'm just gonna get out of this real quick. Hopefully this works because I have a slide for you that I didn't show. And maybe last time we had someone in middle school, which maybe they haven't quite got to that, but for you two in high school, this might be 
of a little bit more interest. So I guess, have you been exposed to different citation styles, either Jack or Matt have? MLA? Um, I've, yeah, we've done MLA 9. That's basically it. That's your the one that you've been using. Yeah, I think Yeah, I know there's like Chicago and stuff too. Yeah, mm-hmm, definitely. So I think these tend to be industry specific. I think the basic one they start you with is MLA. But then, I mean, there's a lot out there. And for example, if this shows up, so MLA is the one that you you reference, but then the one that's typically used, I think it was the same for Miklas, but um, we, I use, I'm in material science and engineering and nuclear engineering. So we use what's called IEEE and, and their different citation styles. All that to say, I really, really, I wish I would have known this earlier in my career, but the use of citation management softwares, especially when you start getting into the more reliable resources, resources is hugely beneficial and can save you a lot of time. So if you have access to a computer or, you know, you can, which I think most people do these days that you can download software on, um, I would really strongly, or you can even ask a teacher. I know they want you to do it by hand at first, but it's really tedious. Um, and using something like Zotero, I know is a popular one, um, but it actually, you can you can get a plugin for Microsoft Word where you can just embed citations. You can copy a citation that's already formatted. Um, it's just really helpful to stay organized and kind of you can enter, enter in the information and then it'll spit out a form formatted citation. So I wish I, it's something to keep in mind if you have to write a research paper anytime soon. Yeah. Okay. No. So, EndNote is great. Yes, EndNote. If you use Linux, there used to be one called Bibis. I don't, I think it's still around. That one is really good until you have to export the citations at the end and then it removes it. It falls apart. From your oh, Word no. doc. Oh no. So if, you, if you save it as a PDF, you're okay. But if you try to say export, then it will auto remove the links that it has from Vivis's SQL library with the word, and it will just leave it blank at the top. Oh, no. That's tragic. I learned that the hard way in grad school. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Cautionary tale. So I guess our takeaway from that, use them. But yeah, you also have to rely on a little of your own. Oh, Elena. Read, read, read the manual. Yeah, read the manual. There you go. Always know how your so citation software works. Okay. So I guess getting into, was about to say you found that one out the hard way. Yeah, it sounds like you did, unfortunately. Okay. So this week, we're going to learn a little bit. And this is, again, please feel free to chime in whenever you have a thought, but how to communicate your results effectively. And I think I had an internship this summer where we had a presentation um, by someone uh, and she kind of posed it in a different frame of reference. So she kind of took a psychological approach to how to con communicate your results effectively. So I think I'm actually going to follow her template of what she presented. So that being said, we're actually going to start out with the, the brain. But first, what do you all think? Jack, if you want to contribute in the chat box or Elena or Madhav, if you want to, you know, unmute or even or Miklas, feel free. Um, what are things when you think about effectively communicating results? What are the pillars? What's important? I guess what do you what do you all think? Anybody have any thoughts? Oh, go ahead. One, one clear message per figure. <laughs> if you can do it. Uh -huh. It's not always doable, but if you can pull it off very helpful uh-huh definitely yeah okay so i guess 
Okay, no thoughts as of now. I guess I can just keep going other than, yeah, thank you, Nicholas. I think that is a very good point and good lesson just to make that. I've definitely tried to make way too com complicated or way too complicated of graphs in the past and it hasn't gone well. Okay, so, and then Jack's contribution, he said, easy to understand language, but use scientific words sometimes to teach and make it sound like you know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, I think <laughs> to make it sound like you know what you are talking about. Yeah, I think it's good to, to kind of relate to a broad audience, but also, you know, for your technical crowd, it's always good to kind of throw in some of that that jargon and those, you know, more hard hitting vocabulary that people can relate to. Okay, so I guess just um, as you embark on your presentation preparation, I would say first, what are you trying to accomplish with your poster in the case of a science fair and presentation? Um, so really, like, what is your goal? If you're trying to, you know, communicate your findings or, or um, you know, in the case of a science fair, it's to have an interesting, engaging project where you can show that you followed the scientific method start to finish, then that's, that can be your objective, you know. Um, and then second, how do you accomplish that goal? And that's hopefully what we'll talk a little bit about today. So first, about the brain. And I am not a biology person by any means, but this is all courtesy of Jacqueline Weeks from Word Tree Consulting. So I just wanna make that disclaimer, but this even I can understand. So first we have a neocortex, which functions, uh, you can see it, it's towards the front of your brain as your higher reasoning center, your limbic brain. It's a little older part of, older or uh, developed longer ago it's uh for memory and emotion and then finally your hind brain is the survival mechanism and um let's see autonomic systems which actually that's the subconscious part of your brain or nervous system that controls things like your heartbeat or your blood vessels dilating etc and as you might expect your higher reasoning center or your neocortex is going to be the slowest part of your brain and the hind brain is going to be the fastest. So that's your initial reaction. It's what helped people stay alive, you know, millions of years ago. And then kind of, you know, as society has developed, we've kind of gained this advancement. Um, so let's think about appealing to all three of those different functional centers of your brain. And first, let's start with your reptilian brain or hind brain, that first initial initial reaction that people have. Let's say when they come up, when people come up to your, say, hypothetical or hopefully real in a few months, uh, poster or presentation or science science fair poster, what, what kind of impression do you wanna make? Like what, what do you think will attract someone to your poster just based off of this hindbrain, this initial reaction, this first impression? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Uh, just to like start some thoughts. Yeah. What to put on your poster? Um, I would think like some flashy letters and stuff. Yeah. Like, and so that everyone can understand it, because it's not just like smart kids at the fair. It's also like common people. So yeah. maybe it involves a bit of like complex language and a bit of simple language. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 definitely. What do you think maybe about the appearance of your poster? Just like maybe if someone's looking around a room, what do you think would attract them to your poster? Um, maybe more like, powerful? sorry, you can go. Maybe like to make it like neat and like um colorful and then uh like bright. Yeah, I think yeah, definitely something that's you know attention grabbing but not too flashy. You know, kind of that a unique take. Use something that would draw one of the senses. Yeah, definitely. I think especially when thinking about the hindbrain, those survival mechanisms are integral there. You know, so you want to really you know catch someone's eye. You know, like think outside the box. If you can attract another one of the senses, I think that'd be an interesting idea. But just a few other 
other um, thoughts about your own physical appearance. Um, so first, dressing for the occasion, if applicable, is always a good idea. The pretzel shops and the malls use smell. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Works every time on me too. Um, and then also, uh, if we're thinking about having someone, in addition to how your poster looks on first glance, also think about your body language. You want to be open. So, um, you know, be inviting and engaging, stand tall, be engaged, genuine. Uh, and it's thinking about, you know, your body language from head to toe, really, to kind of, you know, invite someone from the general public um, into your into your presentation. It's that first impression kind of thing. The smaller um, details. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So then um, if we, I know we're kind of running a little short on time. So then if we move on appealing to the limbic brain and this is memory and emotion. So I think Matt, have you said the smaller details? Mm -hmm. yep. what if, could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Like you said that like all the flashy things and all the just the things that wouldn't pop out like pop out of pop out of you like but it would just be kind of like a QOL like quality of life thing. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I think thinking about those smaller things can have a huge impact. So I see we only have a minute left, unfortunately. And we can definitely go over this the next time as well, but really going through this very quick. So um, when you're presenting and appealing to the limbic brain, you want to think about your volume, the speed of your presentation, and your tone. And then, I guess, finally, your neocortex, which I think is definitely the meat of, of a science fair project. You want to prepare your story, know your audience, be confident, and apply the right visuals. And um, next week, we'll talk about applying the right visuals. back everyone. I'm glad that Emily and Nicholas had our popping room with all of our <laughs> students in there. <laughs> Come on, let's share the students. I don't Yay. Yay. Well, I'm I can't glad. help it. Emily just, she gets them in. She's really good at <laughs> Bravo, it. Bravo, Emily. Thank you. I You're think enjoying the break. Yeah, nice, definitely nice. a joint effort. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it was fun. It's fun. You had a brain? You you showed a brain? Well, yeah, I guess we talked about how you can present an appeal to different parts of the brain. Mm. It was an interesting talk that I saw. Mm. So I kind of adapted that. You know, maybe, maybe we should try to incorporate graduate guest speakers. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, yeah, food for thought. So, yeah, I think that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of someone in the in between the professional and the and the student between the professional and student stage. Yes, yes. So you'll so you'll be the first guest speaker then. <laughs> Um, I mean, if you need someone, sure. I'd try. <laughs> this this is next year, so okay. we're full for this year. So you, you're off the hook for a while. Or, yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of time to prepare. September 2023. Yes, we have All long right. memories. We won't forget. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll be in this position for a little bit, so I'll remember. <laughs> okay. So let's let's go on to the fun part. Right. Right. So. For the three students um, that have or that are in our meeting right now, um, I want all of you to pick a number in your brain, either one, two, or three. And then I want you to either speak your number by unmuting or putting your uh, number in the chat. Ready, go.
missing one. Say something or write in the chat. Okay, um, I, I thought this was a great meeting so far. Uh, we just talked about the different ways to bring out your presentation to people. And um, yeah, I joined a bit late, sorry. That's okay. Um, so what number one, two, or three can you provide for me? Because you have to pick a number one, two, or three. Um, I'll do parts three, or number two. Number two, okay. Well, I had three. So Elena, you are our winner for tonight. Yay. Yay. Um, so just just to clarify, um, you've never uh, received a uh, a prize this year yet, right? No, this is um my first time here. Uh, for oh, this. okay, gotcha. Yeah. Well, congratulations, your first time here. You get a you get a prize. So um, of the five prizes on the left side of the screen, um, you'll see um, what is available to you. So go ahead and and let us know which one you like. The drum. Of course. <laughs> okay. So if you could send an email to prep at utk.edu, we'll need your first and last name and um, home address so that we can send uh, the drone over to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So uh, moving forward, we do have um, several platforms uh, the newsletter, prep account, the prep. Twitter, Instagram, and the Safe of uh, Facebook. <clears throat> um, and so of the three students that are here, can you please let us know what your grade is? Are you in um, middle school or high school? I'm in uh, I'm a freshman in high school. Okay. And Jack is also in high school. So um, Elena, what grade are you in? You're, I think you're in sixth, right? Yeah. Okay. So of the uh, four other programs we have, uh, we do have um, the science fair and the science Olympiad as a middle school and high school program. Um, and then when you are in high school, um, if you're a rising junior or senior, you can also apply to governor school. Um, and then also if you are a uh, junior or senior in high school, is symposium open to everybody in high school? Yes, it is. Yeah, so, all grades in high school. All grades in high school. So um, that's just something you guys can look forward to. Um, you know, Virtual Science Club is just one of the five uh, pre-college programs you guys can get um, um, introduced to. And um, they're all joint effort through SACEF members here on this board, as well as um, other community partners in, in UT. So, Trixie, Trixie yes. don't some people use the same project mm -hmm. for yes. the science fair and for the humanity symposium? Yes. So uh, there have been several students who um, they will present at the symposium and then they'll also present at the stage of uh, at, at the fair. And, um, and a lot of times, I mean, during that time, they do either, you know, do the same uh, I want to say some speech, but they do, what's the word? Ensure that. Same presentation or. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it yeah. is like it's updated and whatnot. So, but so you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel by having four or five different pr projects. You can always um, apply your project and on um, to the, to the different programs. Um, so our next meeting is December 13th, which is next week. Um, and that will be the last meeting <laughs> of the 20, <laughs> I know, of the 2022 year. Um, after this meeting, we will have what? <laughs> 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 
You laughing at me? Me? No, I'm laughing at Jack's comment. <laughs> Rewind it. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Um, so next week is our last, like I said, last um, 2022 um, virtual science club meeting. Um, after the 13th, we are going to be on break for Christmas and New Year's. And then we'll see you for the new year um, on January 10th. So please, please, please um, come over to our meeting next week. And if you have friends that are interested, please drag them along, parents included, teachers, whomever you want to um, come join us for the meeting. Um, and yeah, and I think it will be a nice way to, to end Virtual Science Club for this year. Um, anyone have any closing comments? Agustin, you want to tell them where you are? Well, yeah, that's a good thing of the virtual things now that I am in Argentina, just landed um, oh, wow. for the break. <laughs> wow. yeah. We finished classes in Arkansas on December 1st. My last class was on December 1st. So I was able to travel here the weekend and I just landed uh, last night. <laughs> Have a great yeah. break. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I will. It's 110 out here. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But no humidity, right? No, pretty low, 30%. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> and time zone didn't change too much, right? It's like, what, an hour different? Uh, it's two hours? 10 now. It's about to be 10 o'clock. It's two hours ahead. Two hours. That's not yeah, terrible. It's pretty, it's pretty vertical, yeah. Yeah, small amount of jet lag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes our meeting tonight. So thank you, students, for stopping by. Um, stay safe, stay warm, and we hope to see you next meeting. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.